Donc. That's a good reception. Uh, good evening, a very warm welcome to this Guardian Live event. The more perceptive of you will have noticed I'm not Johnny Friedland, who unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, couldn't be with us tonight, but it's my great pleasure and privilege to be with you here tonight. As I speak, the government is falling apart, so um, <laughs> nothing new in British politics there. If there are any further resignations from the Cabinet, we'll endeavour to give you a, a live update as we go along. Uh, Brexit may, be, may well be one of the topics I'll be touching on with my guests tonight. And also we'll probably touch on the man he recently called a, a petulant child, otherwise known as the President of the United States of America. Um, but we're principally here to talk about uh, John's life and his long and rich career in politics, a life which encompassed service in the Vietnam War and then joining the protests and the campaign to get America out of the Vietnam War, a political career that included 28 years in the US Senate, a disappointing presidential run against George Bush Jr. and Secretary of State during the presidency of Barack Obama. Uh, John, can I first of all say, I thought that your autobiography is a tremendously good read. Uh, it's vivid, it's funny in parts. It's you can say it twice. Revelatory. <laughs> it's moving. It's very good <clears throat> read. And, and those who know me will know that I rarely say that about political memoirs. Um, it's a very good book and we'll come to more contemporary political issues as we go along. But first of all, I want to start with your book. And I want to start right at the beginning, which is one of the places is a beginning for you, was your great-grandfather eight times over, John Winthrop. Now, you tell us he came over from England to become the first governor of what was then called the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, did that suggest to you that you were always destined for a political life, that it was somehow deep in your DNA that you were going to end up in politics? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it had been deep in my DNA, I'd have wound up as a Puritan preacher, uh, which would not have been fun at all. <laughs> Um, first of all, can I thank everybody, uh, and thank you, Andrew, but thank you for the opportunity to share thoughts with you at a rather extraordinary time uh, in all of our lives. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether my presence here today as Brexit crashes around everyone is a continuation of my Forrest Gumpian life. <laughs> 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 But there's a distinct aspect of that, uh, needless to say. And for those of you who read the book, or when you get into the book, you'll see that uh, I truly have led a Forrest Gumpian life. I, I sailed with President John F. Kennedy when I was 18 years old. And I uh, met John Lennon and introduced John Lennon at a major anti-war rally in New York in 1971. And I, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Robin Williams, and Judy Collins, these great names of, of, of music were all part of my political journey. And then one day, a few years ago, I was playing hockey out in uh, Ketchum, Idaho, and I, I was skating hard down the ice, and this guy fell in front of me, and I, I knew I was either gonna crash into him, or we both kill each other, or I'd jump over him and escape. So I literally leapt over him, feet, you know, head first and everything, but as I was flying over him, he decided it was time to get up. <laughs> so he got up and the back of my legs went up. My face went plant right into the ice. There was no time to get hands in front. You could hear the crack across the entire ice. I was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee when this happened. I had not yet been secretary. And so I turn around to see who is this freak who just interrupted my day and my life. And, and he takes off his helmet, and it's none other than Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> so help me God. Uh, and so I, I said, said, well, what do I say to this guy? You know, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know <laughs> who's going to hit you in the face, or whatever the hell it is. But, it, but really, my life has been that way. And here I am today, and, and, the, and, and yesterday I had lunch in the Commons, 
with a number of uh, MPs, friends of mine, and the next day the government's falling, folks. <laughs> or maybe not, who knows, but anyway. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and, and I love London, I love this, uh, I have many family members here. My mother was here, my grandmother was here throughout the war. Had a flat uh, over in uh, Chelsea, and, and it was bombed, but she was not in it. And so, uh, for my whole life, I felt a great tie to, to this region. Uh, I do not, I really was unconscious for many years about John Winthrop. I knew who John Winthrop was, obviously. Um, I never really focused until I did this book on the fact that uh, I had a, uh, uh, other relations. One who was the Speaker of the House of Massachusetts, one who was appointed to the United States Senate. And so I learned a lot about myself and family during it. But no, I don't think I was preordained. I think I was definitely, because of my parents, uh, my parents are World War II greatest generation parents. And to a degree, my mother, who was the daughter of an old Boston family, Forbes family, uh, was born in Paris. Never went to America until she was about 24 years old. Uh, and raised in between France and here in England, in Sussex and um, in Oxfordshire. So we always felt great links to, to, yep. to uh, this beautiful place. My aunt, my mother's sister, would get up at four in the morning to listen to the Queen's speech. I mean, the, 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 you don't believe the Anglophilia that, that was uh, surrounding me, but also a great sense of duty. Yeah. A great sense of responsibility. Uh, I grew up with the ethic. I went to a, uh, to a parochial school, uh, Episcopal. I'm Catholic, but I went to Episcopal school called St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire. And we were taught uh, of, them to who, of those to whom much is given, much is expected. Let, let's talk a bit more about your parents, Richard and Rosemary. Now, your father served with the U.S. Navy Department and thereafter the U.S. Foreign Service. And as you, as you explained in the book, that meant rather a peripatetic childhood for you. Did that leave you with a abiding sense of, I don't know, insecurity, restlessness? No, 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 it gave me an abiding sense of uh, overconfidence, probably. <laughs> uh, because by the time I was, by time I was uh, uh, at the end of high school, I'd been to eight schools. I went to school two years uh, in Switzerland, one year in German Switzerland, so I could learn... German, and there were 150 Italians there, and I learned every swear word there is in Italian and how to speak <laughs> Italian. Because give, us, only give us one of the less fruity ones. What? You remember them? Cretino, ma che sai, pass. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I knew I, it was the only way to eat, folks. It, it, you were at the table, and you would not get food if you couldn't claim some. So I did, and uh, then I went to French, uh, then I went to school in French Switzerland and learned French which I paid a price for when I ran for president. Can you imagine that? It is not a good idea to be president of the United States and be able to speak another language. <laughs> uh, I don't know why the current president does. <laughs> uh, anyway. um, so uh, that had an impact on me. I, I miss being in the Little League. Uh, I missed uh, having my paper route in Washington, D.C., which I admired greatly as a young kid. But I never missed it. I mean, I missed those things, but I had this great adventure. And so I was at boarding school, and my mother sent me a letter in her classic handwritten blue envelope and everything, and it had my directions. Take the train down the mountain, go to, you know, base your law, then go to Montreux, and then you go here, you get on this train, you change trains in Basel, you go to Frankfurt, you change trains in Frankfurt, you get on the U.S. Army train, and you go to Berlin. What, what kid 11 years old doesn't do that? <laughs> and, and so I had this great adventure. I arrived in Frankfurt in the evening, and I'd go to the PX, the American. This, folks, is 1953-4. So the Cold War is very much going on, and I arrived at the... Uh, at uh, the uh, PX thing that they had at the station. And I'd buy a six pack of Pepsis, a stack of comic books, and I'd stay up all night while we went through the Russian sector. And I'd raise my blinds and the, and the Soviet soldiers would come by and rap on the, on the glass with the muzzle of their gun and make me pull the blind down. And I sat alone for, for dinner with the courier 
who had the secret messages all ankle, you know, padlocked to his ankle. Um, I didn't know how he was going to run away if he had to, but anyway, <laughs> kind of been punished. And then you arrive in Berlin, and the American Army Band was there playing John Philip Sousa, Stars and Stripes Forever. Mar I mean, it was a really amazing time. And it was amazing until I took my overconfidence into an adventure to go into East Berlin. I had a diplomatic passport. You were on a bicycle. I was on a bicycle. I still have the diplomatic passport. And I went up to the checkpoint. I went into East Berlin. And I, I really got scared because there was a foreboding darkness to it, which I, as a 12-year-old, perceived. I, people in dark clothes, very few cars. Everything was gray or black and dark. And I actually got scared. I said, you know, I got to get out of here. So I biked out, went home, proudly told my mother and father what I had done, and promptly was grounded and had my passport taken away from me. <laughs> and, and my dad said, you know, you could have been an international incident. You could have been kidnapped. You could have become whatever, which to me, I, I didn't understand it. But I grew up with this remarkable um, capacity for adventure. Yeah. Talking about your father, you say at one point in the book that there was a, I'm going to quote you, formality and distance in your childhood relationship with Pa. And you say you struggled with that. You, you, you regret that you, you didn't manage to be closer to your father? Well, we were close, you know, we were close like a lot of sons, particularly an older son, in doing the things that he wanted to do. So when I went sailing and went sailing with him, you know, we were close. Or when I went skiing, I learned how to ski through him. I mean, great passions were passed to me through my father. And I love that. Um, you know, I love athletics. I love the outdoors. I love sailing. Um, and um, all things about the ocean. But he was remote in other ways. And, and it wasn't until I did the full research on this book that I really grabbed on to all of it. Um, my father was six years old when his father walked into a hotel washroom in Boston and blew his brains out. And my dad learned of that, uh, you know, on just the day, a few days before Thanksgiving. Um, and then his sister, a year later, got polio. And so my grandmother dragged them all off to Europe in the absence of a father. And they paraded around trying to find a cure for polio. Meanwhile, my father was plunked in school after school, um, starting in Germany, where he went, uh, not Germany, in Austria. He went to Vienna, he learned German, he took his studies in German. And then came back to America, he went to Phillips Academy, he went to Yale University, and he went to Harvard Law School. But always was a little, just never had the capacity, as I think probably most of your parents, I would assume, those of you who have greatest generation, old, old you know, parents, Victorian age, and so forth, they didn't talk a lot. They certainly never shared burdens. They never were as demonstrative as we are. And I think our generation, I know our generation, made certain that we raised our children differently. We were very hands-on. Uh, my mother was raised with nannies and you know, so forth, presented in the evening in their best pajamas and hugs from mother and father and aren't you kiddies great, see you tomorrow, probably at dinner time again. Uh, you know, not a great way to understand parenting. So, um, I do write about this, this distance that he had a little bit, and I don't think he could ever reconcile his father's departure at age six. Mm. Which would be completely understandable. Um, in your 20s, you served with the American Navy on the swift boats, fighting the Vietnam War in the Mekong Delta. And I, I, I want to quote I don't know something... Why you say American Navy? It's the only Navy. <laughs> say we I, want to, I want to quote something you say in, in the book. You remark that generation to generation... Most of the people hungry for action are people who haven't seen what war looks like up close. They want to test the warrior ethos, whether as a testing of self or the completion of a duty or an expression of the youthful delusion of invincibility. Was that true of the, the young John Kerry who went to the Vietnam War? It, it was, uh, to some degree, to some degree. 
Um, I mean, I grew up with the war in, in my head. My, as I told you, I told you all about my mother, my grandmother. The Germans took over our house in Brittany uh, as a headquarters during the war. And when they learned that our family knew the Churchill family, et cetera, they promptly bombed it and burned it as they left. When Patton, General Patton, was moving the Third Army down the Contentin Peninsula and coming to liberate uh, Brittany. And, and so um, in 1947, this is my first memory as a child, uh, was walking, holding my mother's hand through the rubble and, and hearing the broken glass crunching beneath my feet. And, and my mother was crying, and obviously as a four-year-old, I was upset. I didn't know why she was crying. So I saw a chimney at one end of the house going up into the sky. I saw a stairwell in the other end going up into the sky, and that's all that was left of the house. Vivid, vivid memory. My grandfather rebuilt the house around that chimney and around that stone staircase. They're still there today. We, last summer, we had, I had, I was one of 29 first cousins. Um, my mother was one of 11 children. So we had a reunion last summer in Brittany at the house of 110 or 15 cousins, all of us together. And, and but that memory was seared in me and, and I played in German bunkers as a kid. As an American kid, I was playing in a German bunker. And I went to the beaches of Normandy uh, maybe two years after that, I was a little older, but I remember seeing the detritus of that invasion on the beaches still. And, and, and I often thought about that because as I progressed in my anti-war and political career after I came back from Vietnam, I realized that my memories of the war in Vietnam were increasingly getting further away than that remarkable memory I had of being at the beach of Normandy only, you know, three or four years after the war had ended. Now, you write very gra graphically, if I may say so, often movingly about your experiences in Vietnam, commenting one moment there was beauty and silence, and the next moment there was chaos and horror. And you take the reader through your own journey as you come to the conclusion that that war was a terrible mistake. Was there a, a particular moment, a crystallizing episode, which brought that home to you, that this was a dreadful mistake? No, actually, Andrew, it wasn't one crystallizing moment. It was a, it was a long process in many ways. Um, we began to have some opposition to the war at college, I was at Yale University, I gave a speech senior year, I gave the class oration senior year, and I remember rewriting it in entirety the week before I gave it, because I, I had written one of what I thought was fairly sophomoric kind of, you know, de rigueur graduation address, and I didn't like it. And I was away with a bunch of friends of mine and we were all talking about the war. We were talking about Vietnam because in 1966 when I graduated, um, the whole dynamic had changed. Lyndon Johnson had asked for 500 troops. It was time uh, to put up or shut up about what you're gonna do with your career. Were you gonna go to Canada? Were you gonna go get married? Were you gonna go to grad school? Or were you gonna serve? And a great many of us in, in my class um, uh, wound up serving. Uh, interesting people, some of them. And by the way, I was talking earlier about that sense of obligation and duty to serve. My classmate of at least four years, it may have been five, at St. Paul's School, with whom I played hockey, soccer, and lacrosse, who was captain of my hockey team, was none other than Robert Muller, who is conducting the investigation. <laughs> I told you, Forrest Gump, guys. <laughs> <laughs> So um, Bobby, as we called him, uh, was, a, was a terrific uh, uh, athlete. But, but I mention him now late because he also served. He went into the Marines. He was at Princeton. And a group of guys at our college, we all signed up. We, we, it was 1965. We were not opponents of the war. We felt a sense of duty. So we were in. That was it. 1966, we graduated. I already had my orders. I was going to basic training. By 1967, 
The first major demonstrations began, the blood on the steps of the Pentagon, the, uh, uh, the, the draft guard burnings, the major sort of opposition coalesced. And in 1968, I was in Vietnam when George W. Bush was graduating from Yale and the revolution had basically taken place. It was a completely different attitude. Universities shut down, there were no exams, the country was at a standstill, National Guard was in the streets. Uh, it, was a, it was a very tense time and, and I, I set the scene for you because it's one of the things that gives me great optimism about where we are today. I know there's a lot of reason to feel oppressed and depressed uh, because of what's happening and not happening in the world, and there is. But ultimately, I come out in, a, in an optimistic place, and we can talk about that a little bit here. But in our, soft, in our freshman year at college, um, we almost went to war with the Soviet Union over Cuba. My sophomore year in college, I'm, I've been substituted in, in the Harvard-Yale soccer game. I'm sitting on the bench and there's a ripple in the audience. President Kennedy's been shot in Dallas. That ripple became, he's dead. Next year, civil rights movement. We sent buses, we raised money. We sent people down on the buses to go to the south, to Alabama, Mississippi, the Mississippi Voter Registration Drive, to break the back of Jim Crow. And senior year, I need 500,000 troops to go over there and fight where I said I wouldn't send you. So all of a sudden, people were facing very, very different decisions. It was a momentous time, and I think about that compared to today, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about what happened in our election because I saw the kind of reaction by people that we, that we ultimately provided with respect to those times. One of the abiding paradoxes about the Vietnam War is about leadership. It was started and then expanded by politicians who were supposed to be the smartest people of their political generation, JFK and the, the brightest and the best, best and as brightest. they're sometimes best ironically called. How do we explain that? Well, I'm fairly forgiving in many respects, not all. I think there's a cutoff point on Vietnam. I think in the beginning, uh, one of my roommates, <laughs> there comes more for us, Cub, but one of my roommates was the McGeorge Bundy's and Bill Bundy's nephew. Uh, sorry, folks. <laughs> so Bill Bundy was Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Far Eastern Affairs, and he came up to the college to give a speech, and afterwards we all went back to our room to have a beer. And we're sitting on the floor, cross-legged, talking to the Assistant Secretary of State, and he says, we need you guys. This is all about stopping communism. We have to, you gotta serve, you know, this is the next generation's moment, and blah, blah, blah. And I thought about those many times, I thought about those years, those words, because it had an impact. I mean, you're sitting there as a, you know, you know, 19, 20 year old, and the Assistant Secretary of State uh, purported to be the best and the brightest. Yeah, he was saying your country needs you. Your country man. needs you, yeah. sure. So uh, that was part of the reason that a lot of us served. And, and um, the problem is this. We were on automatic pilot post World War II. And we were, um, living the, the sort of just the early stages of the post-Eisenhower, uh, post, uh, you know, this, this sense of optimism in America coming out of World War II and feeling our economic power and feeling the strength. And everything was about communism. Joe McCarthy, the McCarthy army hearings, the uh, uh, prospect of nuclear war. I mean, I remember we were the generation that many of you may have been part of that. We have to get under our desks at school, put our hands over our heads to protect ourselves in the event of a nuclear attack. Uh, Duck and cover. If your table was cover. large and sturdy enough, Duck and cover. Run underneath it. Hope you had a really <laughs> solid Teflon school desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, Remember that Jack Kennedy ran for president on the basis of the missile gap with Eisenhower. And it was sort of hawkish. 
And the inaugural address he gave was pay any price, bear any burden, uh, that the torch has been passed to a new generation, we are prepared. And that's what we grew up with. But that's what they were thinking. They were the policymakers, and they saw the domino theory. And regrettably, the best and the brightest, none of them read Bernard Fall, none of them read Graham Greene, none of them studied Dien Bien Phu, none of them knew the real history of Vietnam, none of them were even aware that Ho Chi Minh came to Washington and asked for help to write the Constitution of Vietnam. And so uh, we went into this on automatic pilot, but also with great deception. And I urge any of you here who, who really want to go back and read about this period, the best book I ever read about Vietnam was Neil Sheehan, Bright Shining Lie. It's brilliant, brilliantly researched and brilliantly uh, put together. And what I learned, I didn't read it because he didn't publish it until, I don't know, 10, 15 years after I came back. But I read it then after I had demonstrated against the war and led the veterans in the march on Washington when we, when we stood up to Richard Nixon's threat to arrest all of us. And I got angrier. I mean, I didn't realize the lying, the obfuscation, the exaggeration began in the late 1950s, in the early 1960s. So I didn't go till 1968. And I didn't demonstrate against the war until 1971. So it took time to process it and everybody to get to a place, but with the Pentagon Papers, with McNamara's own autobiography, with the other books that have been written since, uh, uh, and particularly with Ken Burns's masterpiece, 18-hour, 10-part series on Vietnam, uh, there's no room left for anybody who deals with facts, which in today's world is not everybody, obviously. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no room for anybody to say it was anything other than a huge mistake, a lie, and that the government knowingly lied to, to Americans, to American families, to young Americans who went. There's one of the things that guided me. It's one of the reasons why you'll read in the book. I'm the guy who blew the whistle on Oliver North and, and the Iran-Contra. I did it by holding hearings and steadily going after that information because I saw in it exactly what I'd learned in Vietnam. Now, obviously, which you write about, you saw a lot of horror during your part in the Vietnam War. You lost close comrades, close friends. Uh, you, you throw yourself into campaigning against the war when you return home. You're clearly angry. Was it also, at least in part, your activism against the war a way of trying to heal yourself or sure. what you've been through? No question. I, you know, I, I've often said to fellow vets that, that I was very lucky because when I came back, I put it all into ending the war. So, uh, I, you know, I didn't feel guilty. I didn't feel I couldn't deal with the demons and so forth. Um, and, and I was lucky. I was very lucky that way. One of the things I'm proudest of, ladies and gentlemen, is, and it's in the book, not well known. Um, my record was grossly distorted and lied about when I ran for president. And for years, people have never really been aware of what the Vietnam veterans against the war did. But we were the first people to start what were then called rap groups, if you've ever heard of rap group. So we put together rap groups, not rap singing, but rap talking. And we, got, we worked with Dr. Robert Lifton, uh, eminent psychiatrist at Yale University. And we put together these groups so vets could get together and talk to each other and realize they weren't alone, that everybody was trying to work this out. We lost more American veterans to the period post coming home than are on the wall in Washington, D.C. We lost them to suicide, to addiction, to drugs, to alcohol, I mean, it's a terrible story. And the virtue of, of what came out of that is we focused on veterans' education, not just ending the war. We focused on getting adequate uh, stipends for books and for universities so you could go. We actually got the GI Bill extended because it was cut off, and vets would have never had the chance to go to college. We did all of these things. We got a presumption 
of Agent Orange cancer related. So if you serve where there was Agent Orange, there was a presumption of cancer. We did a lot of good things. And the other vets groups, I regret to say, uh, were not the ones who carried uh, that water. So I'm proud of, of the fact that we did that. I'm also, uh, you know, I learned the lesson of the lies. One of my great regrets as a senator, um, you didn't ask me, but I'll lay it out here. And I, can't I was agree. going to, but you've got there first. Yeah. You're drawing uh, the punch now. <laughs> well, because I approached the Iraq vote very carefully. I went to the UN. I met with all of the UN and permanent ambassadors. I asked them if we were to delay and, and, and put together a coalition, if Saddam Hussein does not allow us to inspect and it comes down to having to force him to, will you be there? Will you be part of this? And they agreed that if enough time went by and we actually made legitimate efforts, yes, they would. And I went to Colin Powell. I spent time with Colin, who I greatly respect. I mean, he's a great friend. And, and he was kept in the dark. Uh, he, he really didn't have all the information. And um, I went over to the Pentagon and I was briefed with a group of people personally and I was shown the buildings where the weapons were. And um, we were not told who the sources of that were. We, we asked, but we were not told. So when President Bush gave a speech in Cincinnati saying, I'm going to exhaust all the remedies of diplomacy, we will not rush to war, and I will not go to war without a coalition, major, real coalition of our friends and allies. A, a group of us, Senator Bob Kerry, Hillary Clinton, myself, others, and Bob Kerry knew war, Medal of Honor winner, lost a leg below the knee. We voted to give the president the tool with which he could leverage better behavior out of Saddam Hussein, with an understanding that the promises of the speech had to be kept. Well, they weren't. Dick Cheney and the neocons so, rushed to war. Come in, John. I mean, we'll do it right since you've touched on it. Some would say you were simply naive about an administration led by Bush Jr. and Cheney, if you were going to believe their Well, some can say it, but, but you, had, you had General Brent Scowcroft and, and Colin Powell and George Schultz and others whose voices we did respect and trust who were arguing that you've got, you know, President of the United States needs this leverage, and we're telling you that this is... All right. I want to take you back a bit, because we haven't actually got you into the, yeah. the Senate yet. In fact, I want to now talk about um, your first run for a seat in Congress. Now, you first become a public figure, I suppose, entered the consciousness of a America when you testified to the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee about your opposition uh, to the war and your compelling testimony is then on all the main television networks and you become a public figure at what, the age of 27 and then you're more and more drawn into politics and you make a first run for Congress and it's a flop. You lose, you write, you tell us, I felt like political roadkill. What did that? <laughs> it was a rather vivid image, I thought. Um, Some people eat broken. Well, well, what, 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 um, that I, first defeat, what lesson did it teach you? Let me, let me just say this, first of all. Um, I don't call it a complete flop. I won the nomination, age 27. I came back to the district. I didn't know anybody. We went out and built the strongest grassroots structure you could conceivably have, and I won. And everybody believed that I'd won by so much, there was no way I could lose. So my top political aide, consultant, friend, a guy named John Martillo, who just passed away a few weeks ago, spent most of his time in Delaware with a young guy named Joe Biden. And Joe Biden was running for the Senate, I was running for the House, he was running at age 29, uh, not old enough to serve, but he was going to turn old enough before he got in. And, and Joe won, and I lost. And I lost because what happened was the first round of this fake news kind of distortion. The Lowell Sun, the local newspaper, was run by a rabid John Birch Society member who just unloaded on me. Uh, Doctor a picture of me with Jane Fonda. It didn't exist, but they created one. Put stuff out there, which in this district just hammered away at fairly conservative 
regular folks who kind of recoiled at that, and we did not have time or capacity to respond to it, not unlike, you know, before. So my opposition to the war has been used against me for 40 years. Yeah. Uh, because there are some people who still don't know history, who haven't read enough about it, and can't get over it. Uh, the the, the ra reality is, though, that um, uh, in that district, we lost marginally. And, and yes, I did feel uh, kind of ganged up on. Chuck Colson, who was working in the White House, helped maneuver an independent candidate out of the race who threw his support to the other guy, and then he promptly disappeared to parts unknown, so he was not around for an interview to find out what we knew, which was the White House had been involved in this, and Richard Nixon was involved in it. And Richard Nixon is quoted in, in memoirs as to not going to bed until he had heard that I had lost. It was flattering in a way, I suppose, for uh, a young politician. Forrest Gump. Yeah, yeah. I'm there at the Nixon... Nixon's you know, paranoia. Sorry, remember to sleep. Yeah. Now, 1984 is a happier year, election-wise, for you. I mean, it's not a terribly good year for the Democratic Party, but for you, it sees you elected to the US Senate. And you establish yourself as one of those senators who's prepared to work with senators from the other party across the aisle in a bipartisan way to get things done. You, for instance, strike up a relationship with John McCain. Improbable, but yes. Um, but let me say something about that because it really was uh, one of the best things that, that the Senate produced in the context of my life and I think his. Um, John was five and a half years a prisoner of war. He was shot down in 1967. I was there in 1968 in a very different war from John. I was the skipper of a gunboat in the Mekong Delta. Many of the rivers we went up were, I don't know, from that wall over there to this gentleman here. I mean, you could barely turn the boat around in the span of the river. And it was a very different war. And when I came back, you know what I said. I, I, I said that I just thought the war was completely wrong, but it was never gonna be anything more than a civil war and we should not be in it. So John and I come to the Senate. He was in the House. I came having been Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. And we didn't talk to each other for the first three or four years very much. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you, blah, blah. We were put together by the gods of the Senate where seniority reigns. And we were both flying to Kuwait right after Desert Storm to meet with the Emir and to thank the troops. Uh, and John is seated in front of me and we're at a table with four senators sitting there. Everybody else had fallen asleep. John and I talked. I started asking him a lot of questions about Annapolis, about his family, his father was a huge figure, his grandfather, both four-star admirals. And, and we talked, and he asked me a lot of questions about my war, why did I protest the war, what did I think of, uh, so forth. And we discovered that both of us were sensitive to the fact that number one, uh, we, we, we thought there was a strategic interest in trying to change the relationship with Vietnam that we couldn't just ignore this country with whom we'd had this war. It was next to China, they didn't like China, there were, it was a huge country, very industrious, a lot of reasons to want to be engaged. And we both knew that there had to be an answer to the missing in action, the prisoners of war, POW, MIA, had begun to consume a lot of the American psyche. And you had the Rambo movies, Sylvester Stallone rescuing Americans from tiger cages, and that took a life of its own. So that Newsweek magazine actually had a front page, you know, a cover story saying, are they still alive? This is 1990. So John and I looked at that and said, you know, we need to change the relationship with Vietnam, but most importantly, we need to make peace here at home in America about this war. And you and I can do it. So John and I set out on a 10 year path to normalize relations with Vietnam. We got George Herbert Walker Bush, General Brent Scowcroft. We worked bipartisanly. We, we had hearings. John withstood being accused by the rabid right of being the Manchurian candidate. 
People insulted him in ways you cannot imagine. And we had these unbelievably heated hearings. And ultimately, John and I uh, went to Vietnam together several times. And there's a very poignant uh, time. Can, can I read something from the book? Yeah, yeah, do, do. Can I? Yes. Um, there actually was a section I wanted to share with you all about the beaches of Normandy. Because I find, you know, I, I, we were always shot at first. We were always ambushed in Vietnam. Uh, we never were the first to engage because we couldn't see the enemy. But the mangrove would erupt, the bunkers would erupt, and we'd be ambushed, and then we'd, we'd shoot back. Uh, at D-Day, folks, those guys approached that beach in these tiny Higgins boats, sick, cold, wet, throwing up, uh, a boat next to you being literally blown out of the water beside you, everybody dead. And you're looking at this fortress of concrete embankments up on the bluff with artillery, with 50 caliber machine guns, with mortars, with uh, you know, every major weapon there is. And you know that at a given moment, you're gonna cross a line where your life is worth two seconds, three seconds, whatever it is. Those doors go down, the guy next to you is shot through the head, the guy next to you is shot, they drop. Your mission is to go up that bluff. To me, there, there's a, a level of sacrifice and of courage, or of at least perseverance. I'm sure many people were scared, you know what? But they did it. And the world owes something to that, folks. I find that, I was talking the other day with a British official, we were talking about World War I, when they'd blow the whistle, and the guys would get up and they'd forge forward and the whole line was killed. And they'd blow the whistle, and the next line got up and they all were killed. And the next line still got up and went across. We, we need to think about, I mean, that was stupid. And that was crazy time and, and irresponsibility in terms of generalship and so forth. But it, it, it's sort of a journey we've traveled and we have to, uh, we still have a remarkable soldiers, and remarkable patriots, but we don't do enough thinking throughout the body politic of our nation, certainly, about service and about sacrifice and about what we're fighting for. And here we are with Italy and mumbo jumbo, with Hungary and Orban, with Germany experiencing rattlings of old ghosts, you know, the ghosts of, of uh, of uh, economic fear and of anti-Semitism and of, uh, of, of personal vilification of people because of race or religion or creed or whatever. It's very dangerous and I think everybody senses that. Uh, and there's a dearth of leadership that's willing to define why it's important to be fighting for those things. That's one of the reasons why I thought EU meant something so vital. We didn't form the EU as a response to a need for an economic relationship, the EU was put together in order to stop people in Europe from killing each other. And we need to remember that as we go forward. Um, so John and I both shared that belief that I just expressed to you very deeply. But I'm going to share with you just uh, here is um, what I wrote about making peace and about John's and my experience. Um, no country in history, in all of warfare, has ever done as much to implement an exhaustive accounting of all the missing and captured in a war. The American people can be proud of what our teams accomplished and continue to accomplish in this endeavor. Most Americans are simply unaware that even today, we have American military personnel who continue the search in Vietnam. We still dig up the crash sites of the C-130 or Phantom Jet. We still climb to remote mountaintops and excavate the earth in a rice paddy or a village. On one visit to Vietnam, I was taken out to a lush green field near a small farm. There, a complex scaffold of wood had been built leading down a ramp into the excavated area of a downed C-130 that had crashed and never been recovered. I walked into the area and had an eerie feeling that I was literally 
walking into the crew's resting place, their grave. God had buried them in the very place they had died. But we were going to finally bring them home. Sorry. I wondered about the circumstances of their loss, whether they were killed before impact or whether there was time for terror or panic as they plummeted to earth. Had anyone survived for a while? Did the plane hit with such an impact that it drove itself 20 feet below the surface we were walking on? Inside the excavation, the troops working painstakingly to sift the earth and scrape away time explaining to me how they managed their own emotions and performed the difficult task of recovering the fragments of what was once a vibrant, determined team of young Americans at war. I was amazed by the meticulous archeological methodology of finding scraps of clothing, a tooth, a fragment of a bone, and then undertaking the extraordinary forensic investigation in our labs in Hawaii to make a positive identification. This enormous commitment to keep faith with American military values has produced a remarkable record. The remains of more than 700 service members brought home to still mourning families who all deserved answers. This work was one of those rare chances you get in public life to actually bring people something they waited for for more than two decades, peace. The peace that comes with closure but for me and for John McCain, that wasn't the only reward. In our new friendship and in the work we did, we were ending the war about the war. If a protester and a prisoner of war can find common ground on the most divisive of issues, finding common ground on almost anything else didn't seem so hard after all. Folks, I stood in the jail cell in Hanoi at the Hilton, where John McCain spent a number of years, has moved to a couple of cells. The two of us stood there, Republican, Democrat, liberal conservative, founding this common ground where we made peace. And I'm telling you that when I look at what's happening in the world today and I look at what's happening in our country, if John McCain and John Kerry, protester and prisoner, could find common ground on a cell in Hanoi, we can find common ground in the Congress, in the streets of America, we can put things back but the, together. The sort of search for a common ground, the bipartisanship you described, that, that bipartisanship yeah. has, has, has virtually evaporated. And this predates Donald Trump, doesn't it? Well, it predates it. It goes back. It does what, predate. I mean, you're, you actually, you, you sound very mournful in the book about the Senate. You call, uh, an institution you spent 28 years sitting in, you call it broken. You say it seemed to be a shell of its former self. And you say, I was troubled that by and large, when big people left the Senate, smaller figures seemed to replace them. What's gone wrong? Paul, the, the, what's gone wrong is complicated. And, and I think, uh, complicated but still simple to understand. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated series of events. But Andrew, I think that um, one of the principal reasons we have Donald Trump is this descent into an absence of bipartisanship and of compromise. What happened, I think, is that in 1994, we had the Gingrich Revolution, and, and you had people come over from the House who were just different. They came over with a different agenda. They came over with a hardened ideological uh, uh, priority. They were not willing to tolerate their fellow Republicans dealing with Democrats. They began to create an orthodoxy police who would literally threaten certain senators with retribution by having a primary. Hmm. And primaries became more of a concern to my colleagues than the general election. Um, and so, with the Gingrich Revolution came some critical promises. Smaller government, lower taxes, less regulation, get rid of Roe v. Wade, which is our, our Supreme Court decision on, on abortion, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And what happened is nothing, nothing happened. None of those things were delivered. 
So then you transition from Gingrich. Gingrich was thrown out. He turned out to have his own ethical problems. And with him being thrown out, then came the Tea Party. Uh, and after the Tea Party, which didn't deliver on any of those things, came the Freedom Caucus. And after the Freedom Caucus, which didn't deliver on any of those things, came a hostile takeover of the Republican Party by Donald Trump. It's effectively where we are. Now, fault doesn't only lie on one side. Uh, there are reasons that contributed to this increased ideological division in, in, in the Senate. Um, but I, I know this sounds um, self-serving, but it is true and documentable that I think the Democrats have been more prepared to compromise and more prepared to try to pull people together. And I think the right, the hard right, has been driving a much harder bargain on those senators. And so you see moderates having fundamentally disappeared. Uh, and, and you see them getting bullied on, on certain votes, like the Kavanaugh vote and other votes most recently. So the issue is, you know, how do you get beyond that? Well, folks, the rules of the United States Senate have not changed since the time I was there fundamentally. Yes, there is a difference now in, how, in, the, in the majority vote for judges. So you end the filibuster. But other than that, the rules are the same. What has changed, regrettably, are the people. People who are not prepared, despite all the evidence, to call things on a factual basis. So for those of you who've read Bob Woodward's book, Fear, or if you read Wolf's book, uh, Fire and Fury, or if you just- They all start with the F word, don't they, funnily enough? I don't know what, <laughs> what that's telling us. Well, one, one version of it's spelling. Um, what, what, what strikes me, though, is that um, the, uh, these guys, the, the friends of mine, all sit around in Washington talking with people about every single one of the facts in those books. And they whisper, isn't this terrible? You know, God, you know. And several of them have gone public, folks. Isn't it Bob Corker, Republican of Tennessee, who said that the White House is an adult daycare center? <laughs> I mean, you put the pieces together after a period of time. And, you know, what, what one, just one minute, I want to finish one thought. When you read that the Secretary of Defense is being told by the President, you gotta assassinate this guy, and he hangs up the phone and turns to his fellow generals and said, well, we're not doing that. When you have a, 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 a fact that documents are being taken off the President's desk so that the President doesn't sign them, yeah. folks, that's a <laughs> constitutional crisis. Yeah. I don't know what you call it. Uh, you know, it's, you know, so, now, 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 let's step back, because we mustn't skip over this part of your career to, to a president I think you probably had warmer feelings towards, not least because you served President Obama in his second term as Secretary of State. I want to ask you a few questions about your time in the State Department. Of course, part of the role, quite a big part of the role, was interacting with Vladimir Putin. Tell us, is he a strong man, or is he a man leading an essentially weak country who's just pretending to be strong? What do you think? No, no, no. He, he, he is personally a strong man. And he, he runs the, I mean, look, you don't, you don't survive in that system and you don't become president and then go to the prime minister, but you turn around and kick the other guy out and come back and be president yeah. again without skills. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I met with uh, President Putin more than anybody else in the administration, and he and I actually were able to arrive at agreements on things. We made things happen. Um, Russia was particularly helpful in the negotiations on the Iran nuclear agreement. Russia was helpful on the Paris Agreement. They could have stood in the way of it. Russia was helpful on several, we had a trifecta of, of environment agreements that year. We did the Montreal Protocol, ozone, we did the ICAO, which are the airlines, which were joined in, and we did the, um, uh, we did the, uh, what was the third? There was a, another, um, 
uh, refrigerant, I guess, hydrofluorocarbons. And, and so we, we, we had successes. I, I got the president to agree to create the largest marine mammal protection area, marine protected area on the planet. It's the Ross Sea in Antarctica. And I negotiated with Lavrov to get an agreement on a way to approach Syria. Uh, it, it, it fell apart for various reasons, but the biggest opposition to that came from our own Defense Department and from our unwillingness to do anything with Russia that would have gone after the terrorists, gone after Daesh, ISIS, faster, and, and so forth. I thought that was a mistake. But the bottom line is um, he's ruthless, he's tough. Uh, what he did in, in Ukraine is absolutely inexcusable. During every conversation that I've just described and all of the things that we were able to agree to cooperate on, we agreed to completely disagree and we fought over Ukraine. We placed the toughest sanctions in place. We solicited our European friends to join us. They did and they've been steadfast and we have been able to keep those sanctions in place to this day because of what's happened in Ukraine, which is the only nation state in the world I think that has actually crossed internationally recognized boundaries and annexed and taken yeah. territory illegally. But of course, that, that the sanctions haven't worked in that sense. Well, the sanctions have hurt. It's going Russia, on. But it it may have hurt, but it hasn't made them retreat. No, and, and I believe that the current round newly imposed sanctions are going to have a very hard time uh, achieving the goal that the administration is seeking. I mean... We had succeeded in getting Iran. You know, when I sat down with, with Foreign Minister Zarif in New York in 2013, September, an American Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of Iran had not met for 40 years. That was a big moment, I remember, very big moment. But what was big about it was that Iran, at that moment, had 12,000 kilograms of enriched uranium. It was enriching up to 80%. It knew the entire nuclear fuel cycle. They had a plutonium reactor they were about to commission, which would have created two bombs worth of, of, of uh, weapons-grade plutonium a year. They had 27,000 centrifuges deployed, 19,000 of them spinning. In other words, they were two months from breakout to have a nuclear weapon. And every intel agreed on that. Today, still as we sit here tonight, because France, Germany, Britain, uh, England, and, and, and China are all in agreement to try to keep the deal in place. I mean, what do they know that Donald Trump doesn't know? No, don't answer that. Um, <laughs> but think about yeah, it. We haven't got all night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the point is that today, Iran has less than 5,000 centrifuges. It's their oldest generation. They, are, they have to destroy the others. They are limited to 3.67% enrichment. They're limited to 300 kilograms of the stockpile, which at, which at the level of 3.67%, you physically cannot make a nuclear weapon. You cannot make a bomb right now. If they were to try to break out to go make one, we would know it instantly because we have radio transmission seals on the centrifuges and on the stockpiles, etc. We have the right to trace from cradle to grave every ounce of uranium that they take out of their mines. Uh, and, and so it goes. So we have 130 additional inspectors in Tehran. And the bottom line is this deal is the tightest, most stringent, accountable, transparent nuclear arms agreement on the planet. That's Iran. Uh, we've got to talk also about Syria. When you be about, about Syria. When you became Secretary of State, more than 100,000 Syrians had already died. Uh, more died on your watch. Many more have died since. Why have the Western democracies so utterly failed to stop the carnage in Syria? Because there's a lack of will to accept certain risks in what it would have taken, at least previously, to bring people to the table. And that includes us. I write in the book about my, my, my own belief that the United States needed to hold Assad accountable. And I propose that we undertake uh, what's called standoff 
uh, attacks against Assad if and when he flew and dropped his barrel bombs on children and women, if and when he used gas, if and when he broke a ceasefire. And I thought that was the only way we were ultimately going to bring them to the table in Geneva. And regrettably, uh, the, the Congress, I mean, people in the United States just kind of, you know, just didn't want to do it for a lot of different reasons. And I did not succeed in persuading my boss, the president, that we ought to take the risk of doing that. I, I felt confident because of my negotiations with the Russians, I felt absolutely confident they wouldn't do anything. They might have even welcomed it because it might have helped tame his willingness to snub his nose at them sometimes and say, I'm not doing that. And it would have conceivably, but because Russia became our partner. Sergei Lavrov was my co-chair of the International Syria Support Group, which we created in order to bring everybody to the table. And, and contrary to everybody's judgment, we actually got Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Egypt, Turkey, uh, all at the table, plus Russia, plus China, plus Iran. All of them at the table. They never sat at a table like that together for a while. But we couldn't get Assad or the extremists. We needed to coordinate somehow to be able to drive people to a table where we could get it. I think it is one of the great, it's the 21st century's greatest stain right now is the failure to have done what the international community should be doing to make peace in a place like Syria and to hold everybody accountable to it. It's a tragedy. Uh, it remains a tragedy and I don't to this day see the diplomacy taking place that is working to try to achieve that. Okay, I'd like to introduce some questions that have been submitted by the, the audience here, John, and you knew this was going to come up. Uh, as a friend to this country, we're interested in your opinion anyway. Paul Turner puts it very plainly. He asks, what are your views on Brexit? <laughs> well, I, uh, look, I don't want to get in the middle of this moment uh, where, and not because I don't have a view, we've expressed the view and I'll tell you what we've said. But I, I think, you know, the prime minister's in, in a fight here. It's not appropriate for an American former secretary of state to come over here and start giving advice and lobbying uh, grenades into the middle of this battle. Uh, well, everybody else is. You know. Well, I know, but... <laughs> you might as well toss yours in as well. I know, but they're either the Irish or the Brits or the Europeans. You guys have it. <laughs> uh, this American... Well, let me put it... Let me, I'll say this. Okay. Yeah. President Obama and I both were here before the referendum. We were asked publicly what our feelings were, and both of us expressed the reasons for why we are Remainers. And we, were, uh, we both uh, remain that. To the best of my knowledge, the president hasn't changed. I, I, I think this is not the moment for what I talked about earlier, for the EU to be coming apart. Uh, that's not the debate right now. They have, a Dex, they have a Brexit deal. The debate is whether the deal's good enough and people are going to move forward. I'm not going to get in the middle of that part of the debate. Oh, of course, some of the Brexiters, and we would be interested in your opinion on this as, as an American particularly, some of the Brexiters says it's going to be a dream because we can strike a wonderful free trade agreement with Donald Trump. <laughs> Do you think that's going to work? Is their, their dream going to be a reality? Or is it a fantasy? Uh... Well, first of all, I think you have two years ahead of you of some pretty tough negotiations to find out what the technical arrangements are going to be and how it's going to work. Yeah. You can't strike any arrangement until you know what those are. Yeah. So two years from now, if Donald Trump's still president, we'll see what kind of deal you get. All right. You don't sound that optimistic. I'll pass it on to them, Jacob rees mogg and his gang. Um, Ruth Howard asked this question. It's about your own country and your own party, the Democrats, do the results of the midterm elections give any grounds for hope that Trump will not serve two terms as president? Was the predicate to that? Oh, well, uh, let me say it again. It's from Ruth Howard. Do the results of the midterm elections uh -huh, okay. give any grounds for hope I got it. that Trump will not serve two terms as president? Well, there's always hope, uh, but I mean... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the midterms, let me put the midterms in a context. I think the midterms are a very dramatic moment. I was worried about them the night of. 
I was a little worried the next morning. Didn't quite know where it was going. But now the verdict is in. Uh, this is the most significant number of new Congress men and women going to Washington since the Watergate class of 1974 when it was elected two months after Richard Nixon had resigned. That's huge. It is also a class filled with interesting people. I mean, you got, you know, Antonio Delgado from the New York 19th, who's uh, a Rhodes Scholar and capable guy, organizer, ran in a very improbable district. Max Rose is an Afghanistan veteran, ran in Staten Island, improbable. And even the, even the races of Stacey Abrams and of uh, Gillum in Florida, uh, I don't see the, that, those glasses as half empty. I see them as half full. Because it was quite remarkable that in the state of Florida where everybody moved not to pay taxes, are embracing a very progressive candidate who probably was going to look for some revenue. And they knew it. And he came within a hair. Likewise, for, for Abrams, to, and they're not over yet, by the way. The counting still, you know, I don't know how it's going to work out because it's once again Florida and Broward County presenting a problem. Um, but I think it's quite remarkable, but even more so, seven governorships including in Kansas and Wisconsin, flipped from Republican to Democrat. Six legislatures flipped from Republican to Democrat. 290 legislative seats around the country flipped from Republican to Democrat. If you look at the youth vote, the youth vote was the highest it's ever been. It was up at 31%, which is way too low, by the way. But it went up from 19%. It's a 55% increase. And those are people 18 years old to 29 years old. And overall, 113 million Americans went out to vote in the midterms, broke all records. Never have we been above 100 million Americans voting in a midterm. So yeah, I, I see a lot of hope in that. I see a lot of reality of course correction and of change. I also see a vitality to our democracy that people didn't know was there. And I think it's a warning signal. And to me, it's, it's an encouragement to start now to be putting together the organization to guarantee that in 2020, uh, we take the next step. Well, funny you should mention 2020 because Jeremy Johnson wants me to ask you, who do you think would make the best Democrat challenger to Trump for 2020? Well, I, I've... I've said very clearly at home, and I'm going to say the same thing here. Uh, I'm not picking candidates right now. I, you know, I, I picked Barack Obama to be the keynote speaker at my convention. And I fully expected him to renominate me four years later for re-election. <laughs> hey. hey, you can throw your hat in. You can somehow, throw your hat in now. <laughs> somehow, I wound up working for him. <laughs> uh, but it's okay. Uh, so uh, the reason I say that to you folks is I'm perfectly happy, very happy to pass the torch to a new generation to give somebody the, the you know, to, to say, hey, you're going to be a great president to go to work for it. Obama called me at midnight after being <laughs> drummed, I mean, slapped in uh, New Hampshire, losing handily to Hillary in New Hampshire. He calls me at midnight and he says, are you still with me? And I said, I told you I'm with you, I'm with you. What do you want to do? He said, well, let's do it in South Carolina in two days. So I went to South Carolina, I stood up and I endorsed him. I was the first guy to endorse him. So I'm happy to pick somebody I think can win. I'm not convinced as I sit here tonight that I know who that person is. Uh, okay. I don't know who can win. Uh, all right, you don't want to name a name, but I'm going to put a question to you from Dieter Van Hook, because uh, he asked a good question. He says, what characteristics would the ideal Democratic presidential nominee have to take? Authentic. Authentic, any more? Authentic, authentic will do. Well, more than that, I mean, I, I want to say- Bit of class, bit of class, bit of, um, by that I mean dignity and authority. <laughs> if you were up against Trump, <laughs> Americans might be ready for a slight change. In well, for a starter, you know, no porn stars in your history. 
I, don't, I mean, seriously, folks, what, what has happened? Really? You tell us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, can I spontaneously raise something? Because I know we're, yeah. we're going to kind of run out of time. Yeah, yeah. So get it in before we do. You mind? Yeah, yeah. No, no, of course not. Because it pertains to this issue of, of who ought to be, where we ought to be going. Um, it's hard to translate some of the issues that we face today into uh, an acceptable set of choices that you might figure are legitimate voting issues that you can go to the ballot box and say, boy, I'm voting for this for this reason. And it, 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 it confounds me a little bit. I'm troubled by it, and you should be troubled by it, folks. Uh, because we face several life-threatening challenges that if we don't respond very quickly, uh, we are inviting catastrophe on this planet. I mean, literally. I, I followed the issue of climate change for 30 years. Al Gore, Tim Wirth, Frank Lautenberg, Jack Hines, myself, others held the first hearings on climate change in 1988 when Jim Hansen first said to us, this is happening now. Here we are in 2018. And we have a climate denying president of the United States who pulls us out of the work we did in Paris at a time where every day really matters. We, we, we uh, I mean, these fires in, in, in California, one of the reasons you have this amazing, you, obviously you have Santa Ana winds, yes, but we have those every year, all the time. We've had them before. What we haven't had before is this major amount of drought, then massive rainfalls that occur because there's greater moisture in the ocean and it goes up into the air and it and becomes rain. So we have much more intensive storms. Last year we had three storms in the United States that cost us $265 billion, folks. Harvey, Irma, Maria. Maria destroyed Puerto Rico. Harvey dropped, it was supposedly a once in 50,000 year storm. It dropped as much water in five days on the Houston, Texas area as flows over Niagara Falls in an entire year. Irma had the first recorded sustained winds over 185 miles an hour for 24 hours. Now, we agreed in Paris to put $100 billion into the Green Climate Fund. There's probably about six billion in there today. And nation states are making bad decisions because they don't have the money that was technically supposed to be there to help them make the, the investments in alternative, renewable, sustainable energy that are there for the waiting, but are expensive for them. They can't afford it, so they go with coal. China is on target now, still. I was just there a week ago talking about it. China is still on target to build a whole set of coal-fired power plants to create 250,000 uh, 250, uh, megawatts of power. And India, similarly. <laughs> We shouldn't be building one single coal-fired power plant anywhere on the planet if we're going to meet the standard of what has to be done. And, you know, the G20 of the countries with the money, someone ought to go to the G20 and lock the door and, and say, we're not leaving here unless we have fully funded the $100 billion and we get serious about doing what but we what, what do. wasn't that, in, in a way, the problem now looking back with the climate change agreement in Paris, which many people, including yourself, had high hopes about, Donald Trump's torn up America's commitment, but to be absolutely fair to the United States, none of the other major industrial nations have uh, published plausible ways they're gonna meet their commitment. Correct, have, let, me, let me speak to that. You're absolutely correct, and, and I wanna say something about that. Because I said what I'm about to say, I said at the plenary session of the Paris Agreement right after it was gabbled. And what I said was, folks, we're all elated. We've been working at this for years. And we've passed an agreement with 196 countries signing on. But nobody should leave Paris believing 
that we are guaranteeing the world we're gonna hold the Earth's rise of temperature to two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. What we are doing in Paris, what I said, what we're doing in Paris is sending a signal to the global marketplace that 196 countries believe this is happening, that we believe we have to respond, and we are gonna make our best efforts to try to get this done, knowing that those 196 countries together represent the largest market the world has ever seen. And what we're gonna do is excite the private sector. We're gonna excite capital investment to move faster on lowering the cost of solar, to move faster on battery storage, to move faster on fourth generation modular nuclear, if that's what it takes to move. I mean, we have the technologies. We just don't have the willpower to do what's necessary to make these other alternative choices. I've been working with Vietnam in the last years, I'm going over again in January, to see if we can transition them off of coal. And they have the perfect, they have hydro, Mekong River, they have 45% of their grid is hydro. They could have a intermittent fuel. They don't use 45. They use only about 31. So they have room to grow. They have wonderful wind. They have extraordinary sun. And they have gas. So they have a bridge fuel. So you could create a virtuous smart grid that would actually allow you to provide for all the energy needs of Vietnam without burning any coal. Meanwhile, China is selling them coal. They're still burning the coal. The coal industry is pushing back and, you know, it's economic interest. So how do you, you, you've got to fight that. And our bet in Paris was on the private sector. We were betting on the fact that the next Sergey Brin or the next, you know, Bill Gates or whomever is gonna come up with that methodology by which you can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Or somebody's gonna come up with the methodology for battery storage that blows the roof off of solar. This can be done, I'm convinced of it. But it's the private sector that's frankly gonna make that breakthrough. No government in the world, I think, can move fast enough in today's world to do what we need to do to deal with climate change. But you all, the voters, have got to make damn sure that everybody who's going into office anywhere understands this threat. We're going to have climate refugees. Look at Europe. Europe's already crushed under this transformation that's taken place because of immigration. Germany, Angela Merkel, weakened because of it. Uh, and, and other places impacted. Italy significantly impacted its politics by, by immigration. Well, imagine what happens if water dries up and you can't produce food in Northern Africa. Imagine what happens when Nigeria hits its alleged 500 million people by the middle of the century because there's nothing happening there in terms of planning and families and whatever. Uh, you're gonna have hordes of people in the Northern part of the Mediterranean saying, knocking on the door. You know, I'm telling you, if you don't believe me, just go read the literature, read what the IPCC said a few weeks ago. They said that for us to prevent that extra 0.5 degrees centigrade increase, we have to do historically unprecedented steps. That's the quote from the, from, from the report. So I, I'm adamant about this. Why am I so adamant about it? Well, I've got kids, I've got, I've got grandchildren. And, and I see what's happening. And I've seen it get worse and worse and worse and worse. And the, the oceans are now threatened, folks. I started oceans conferences, which we held first in Washington, then in Chile, then in Washington, then we had one in Malta last year. It was in Bali this year, next year it's in Norway. We've raised over $10 billion. We've set aside tens of thousands of square kilometers of ocean for preservation. But we've got people, criminal enterprises on the high seas of the world, raping the oceans, drift net fishing, strip mining the oceans, throwing away half the life of what they catch, and illicitly bringing the rest to production and to ports. The next time you go into a restaurant, I, I love eating fish, but we don't have any cod left in Massachusetts. We, 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 we have to stop fishing striped bass for 10 years to bring the stocks back but in too much of the world, there's no conservation. There's no effort whatsoever. So bottom line, Andrew, take cyber. Let me give you another challenge. You can bring a country to its heels in a day, in hours. 
It doesn't take somebody pulling a trigger. You just have to press send. And you can get into other countries' water treatment facilities, transportation networks, air traffic control, defense security warnings. I believe, and I'm, I've called for this, that, that, that we should have for cyber today in the world exactly what we did for nuclear weapons in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, which is arms control. We need an arms control protocol regimen where we all agree on what we're not gonna do to each other and we have means of enforcing it and we hold people accountable. Instead, we have people talking about a rush into space for space weaponry. And we have people talking about withdrawing from the intermediate nuclear treaty, uh, you know, uh, and, and so forth. So we're, we're, we're <laughs> what confounds me is every challenge we face on this planet, and I'm not exaggerating with the exception of God-given catastrophes, earthquake, volcano, tsunami, etc. With the exception of those things, everything else is the result of choices that human beings make or don't make. Have any of you ever met a child, two and a half years old, three years old, who actually hates another person because of their skin or their color or their race or their religion? No, of course not. They may hate their broccoli or their nanny or whatever that is, but they don't hate people. And it's taught, it's all taught. For years, ever since World War II, we have been trying to teach a different way of approaching conflict resolution, organizing our lives on this planet. If you go back through the first millennia, it was all brute force, might makes right. Genghis Khan, Romans, Greeks, killing gladiators, but what millions of people died. You come into the next millennia and you have a different, you, you sort of have this transition to the, from the dark ages to the middle ages to the you know, Renaissance, uh, enlightenment, age of reason, blah, blah, blah. Rights of man, John Locke, Thomas Paine, and evolution through the French Revolution, through Britain, uh, through the Magna Carta. We've developed, we're all moving in a direction as human beings to empower ourselves to deal with life and how we organize ourselves. Who do we give power to? How do we give it? I got news for you. We've tried everything there is on the planet. We've tried everything. You got a new ism, tell me what it's called. But, you know, we've had benevolent dictators, malevolent dictators, despots, uh, you know, uh, We've had monarchies of one kind or another, parliamentary. We've had constitutional, we've had non-constitutional. We've had socialism, communism, fascism, everything. And as Winston Churchill correctly said, democracy is the worst form of government in the world, except for everything else. And even when it produces everything. Donald Trump as president. Even when it does. Even when. Because look at the course correction we just had. That's why I'm saying, I am an optimist, folks, and I'll tell you why. Despite what I just said, <laughs> no, I, what I'm doing is, what I said, what I just said is, I define the problem. I define the problem. I also define the historical road we've traveled to try to deal with the problems. But I didn't say we have to give in to them. I don't believe we do. I didn't say they're gonna beat us. They don't have to. That's the difference. And the fact is that we have solutions to each of these problems. But you know what we don't do? We don't make them voting issues yeah. in enough yeah. places. Well, I'm an optimist too, though being British, I always take an umbrella just to be on the safe side. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to this Guardian Live event for absolutely fascinating conversation with my very special guest, John Kerry. We're going to go out that way, same way we came.
Thank you very much.